Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Uh, maybe a reaction thumbs up if you can hear me. Great, thanks. So we'll just give it a, a minute more, uh, give everyone a chance to, to join up, okay? Okay, I guess it's time to start. How's everyone doing? Um, if you wouldn't mind, um, you can uh, switch on your video if you can, even if it's just for a few seconds, uh, just so I can scroll through uh, and, uh, and, and so you can see who your classmates are. Uh, so many shy people in the class, uh, that's better. <laughs> Come on, as the engineers of the future, you have to be able to put yourself forward and, uh, uh, and that includes uh, putting your, uh, your, your picture forward and all that, yeah? Um, also, if uh, you've identified your class rep, uh, please do uh, email me. So the class reps, please email me. That's a, a good way to uh, keep the point of contact uh, uh, among everyone in the class. And uh, I, I think you have this WhatsApp group going. And uh, of course, I'm not part of that. That's where you can curse us out as, as much as you want. But uh, yeah, maybe through uh, your your WhatsApp group or something like that, uh, you can identify your your class rep if uh, there isn't one identified already. Um, do, do you already have a class rep? Okay, seems not. So uh, please go ahead and and try to get one going. Okay. Um, so I thought for today, what we would start with is uh, just browsing through. The existing set of notes. So you've seen, uh, well, there are three sets of notes up there on the Dropbox folder. But um, I, I guess the, the third one I just sent through this morning. So I don't expect you'll have gone that far with it. But uh, um, we can just squ squeeze through the notes and uh, you can highlight any questions you want to discuss further with me. And then I've got an, ex an exercise for us to work through. So it's not the same exercise as in the notes because uh, that sulfur dioxide example, I want you to, to try that a, a bit further. So I've got a, a different example and we'll just work through that one. And then later on, we'll work through in more detail on the sulfur dioxide example. So um, if there are, uh, so, so that's the program for the next hour. I do have another meeting at three o'clock, so uh, we'll, we'll stick to the hour. But um, yeah, if there are any other things you want to do, uh, maybe um, you can speak up now or you can uh, send me the message by the chat. Um, anyone want to say anything right now? Please remember to unmute yourself um, if, you, uh, want to, if you want to request anything now. Okay, if not, I'm going to share screen. Okay, uh, can you all see that? <clears throat> so uh, maybe just use the reactions and, and let, okay. Okay, you can see that. Okay, thanks. Okay, so maybe let's just uh, have a look through the notes here, where is it? Yeah, so first, as I say, uh, we'll just have a quick look through the notes so you can highlight to me any areas you want me to, to look at and then we'll go over to the exercise. 
So on the first set of notes, uh, that was pretty introductory, um, just giving you a basic sense for what the reactor looks like and um, what the, uh, how the kinetics and hydrodynamics, just basic concepts there. So this was just to have a look at. And yeah, here introducing the reaction rate and noticing the, the units for this, so the default units. And as we said, there are many different versions of the reaction rate. And so sometimes you get different um, units, but there we carefully de define what we mean by that reaction rate and so on. Um, the interplay among mass transfer and hydrodynamics. Um, yeah, the fact that you can, of course, solve the reactors using computational fluid dynamics. But then um, we started introducing those ideal types, which are a little easier to solve as well. So these, uh, the batch, plug flow, and mixed flow reactors. <clears throat> then we started looking into reaction stoichiometry. So we started with the basics here. Um, reaction stoichiometry does, uh, or rather reaction kinetics, uh, becomes a lot more interesting than this. So right now, uh, these are fairly basic homogeneous reactions. You'll see when you get to homogeneous uh, or heterogeneous catalysis and, and things like that, um, things get uh, much more interesting. Um, polymer kinetics and uh, biochemistry, those are all very large and interesting areas. So those are the kinetics. Um, and then a bit on the thermodynamics. One thing I didn't emphasize is that the thermodynamics, um, the activity is the driving force for reaction. So we've just been working with concentration as if that's uh, the end of the story. But of course, if you go back to your thermodynamics, uh, you'll see that activity is the driving force uh, among many of our chemical processes. And so um, that is the, the true basis for your reaction rates. So um, please uh, do have a review of your thermodynamics uh, uh, notes and, and lectures uh, towards understanding the fundamentals of reaction engineering. Um, and then, yes, of course, the relationship between your Gibbs free energy and your reaction equilibrium and you can show that uh, there's an approximation where you can identify the heat of reaction and its relationship with the kinetic rate constant. And we'll do all that in more detail when we get to the, uh, the energy balance side of uh, reaction engineering. Okay, so I guess that's it on the first set of notes. Are there any questions or comments there? And please remember to unmute yourself um, if uh, you'd like to speak up. But so far, you all seem very shy. It's like the first date uh, we're having here, yeah? Okay, um, so that's the first set. And then uh, going on to the next set here, uh, we introduced these ideal reactors. And so hopefully you recognize a picture like this from your chemical engineering fundamentals course. So where you define the differential element and you said in this little element, you have flow in and flow out and there, there might be reaction happening inside and all those things. And uh, there might be heat transfer across that. So convective heat flow, or it might be conductivity uh, heat transfer. So all those things can happen across these little elements. And if we choose them small enough, we can treat them as having single concentrations. And that's the beginning of us developing our uh, material and energy balance. So that's all outlined here. And here we took the simplified approach. We, um, we, we showed that we could simplify all this and just look at the, what's crossing the boundaries and add up the changes in the little elements uh, due to reaction. And, and that was our entire mole balance. So in a sense, this is a simplified way of developing this balance. But um, I'm also on that 2EF chemical engineering fundamentals course. So I, in, in that round of lectures, I unpacked this fully. And, and so, uh, well, in fact, I think I saw this class for, for that course, right? So you might have some bad memories of me uh, from, from that, that course. 
Um, so anyway, I'll be producing these video lectures in, in much the same way. So it's useful to, to go back and, and review that uh, because that's really the basis of it. Because after dealing with all that complication, um, this probably looks much easier to you than what we did there. <clears throat> So going further, again, you know, constantly check your units, check that every single term in each equation makes sense in terms of uh, the units. Uh, that includes checking on your reaction rate, as we mentioned before. And, and then we look at the specific instances. So we introduce that basic framework for developing material balances, and then we go into, for each specific reactor type, um, how that uh, balance shapes up. Then here's your CSTR, your perfectly mixed reactor with flow through. And so that's yet another instance of a reactor type. And again, we take that general balance and we show its specific instance here. And then um, in terms of your, your PFR, it's, it's much the same thing. So that's all developed there. What else is in the set? So then of course, uh, we develop it from unsteady state showing all the variations across. And then we look at the simpler versions of these equations also. So when you do reach a steady state, can you, um, can you get a more efficient representation? And uh, at steady state, um, I, uh, it, it, you should always go through this exercise of, of um, how do I say, um, of, of testing whether you believe a steady state is possible. And in chemical engineering, I know in a number of the courses you've seen so far, that's almost the first step. You, you almost don't think about that step anymore. Um, you you might write the equation and then straight away butcher it and say, all right, cut out this uh, the DDT term, steady state that takes care of it. It's not the case um, ar around this level. Remember now, um, in third year going into fourth year, you are slowly transitioning to unsteady state operations. In fourth year, uh, we'll be looking in quite a lot of detail at unsteady state um, control. Of course, uh, it, it has to be unsteady if you want control. So. Um, developing and designing controllers to maintain operations in a reactor. Um, so that's inherently unsteady state and, um, and you need to be able to develop your models in that way. So um, we'll, we'll be relaxing that steady state assumption quite a lot uh, in this course. Okay, and then uh, I think the last bit here, it's just in terms of conversion. So this part is just saying for the different versions of reactor, um, we define the, the conversion slightly differently. And that's because the reference amount, right? We can think of, of these things as reference amounts. So currently or at the end of the reactor, there's some concentration that in a sense you've achieved. You've achieved a certain conversion or you've formed a certain amount. So that's an achievement also. So that's what's coming out of that reactor but also um, you've got a certain reference amount here. So um, the reference amount might be what you've started with or uh, what the, the system has entered at. So these are reference amounts and those influence our overall conversion, right? So defining the conversion, uh, that's another important aspect of developing our, our equations. So it's all summarized here, the three reactor types. Okay, any questions or comments there so far? Okay. Then um, this is the set that just went out today. So I don't expect you to have had much of a look at this, but uh, it's basically unpacking that mole balance um, to a greater extent. And then we are looking at applying that in, um, in more general cases. So looking at if you have, for example, a gas phase reaction and your reaction might be changing your flow rate through that reactor. So if uh, that's what's happening, then that's going to um, influence your material balance. It's going to upset your concentrations. So how do you still develop um, your material and energy balance in the face of all that? 
So that's one. And then the other one is what if you are deliberately going and, and forcing the, the flow rates to change? So that's upsetting um, the entire volume of the reactor space. So with all that, um, we need to be able to model uh, the system and take account of any such changes. And so uh, those balances are developed there. Okay, so as I say, uh, please um, uh, speak up. Um, I'm not sure if I'll, I will see the hands up because you can see uh, this is the interface I'm using. So uh, feel free to unmute and, and just speak up if you have any questions or comments. Okay, so in terms of the exercise for today, um, I thought we'd go through this problem. So of course, as, as I say in the notes, uh, there is an exercise defined, but I want you, you to keep trying that one. So we'll do this exercise for now, and you'll just get to uh, get a sense for how to lay out these problems. And uh, you can apply that in that exercise in the notes. <clears throat> okay, so here it's a simple reaction. Uh, one molecule of A, uh, you, you could think of it as decomposing into two molecules of B. We are given a kinetic rate constant and we are told this is an elementary reaction. So always when you get this kind of information, it's nice to take a step back and say, yes, I know all the kinetics about the system. There's, uh, there's nothing I need to infer. This means I can straight away go and write down the reaction rate because you are told this is elementary. Um, it looks like it's not, uh, not reversible. So we would be able to say here, um, the rate of consumption of component A is simply KCA, right? So um, it doesn't, uh, the stoichiometric coefficient here is minus one. So this is just KCA. And then we also are given K here. So we know this number K. Of course, uh, CA is going to depend on what type of reactor this is and what the concentrations are in the feed flows and what the concentration was in the reactor initially, all those good things. But uh, right now um, we are fine to just say, yes, we know the kinetics and, um, and now we can, once you have this, um, most of your work is already done. Um, okay, the other thing I wanted to say was, um, you see this is given to us as if it's uh, nice and constant. And that's because so far we are only talking about the isothermal case. So as we go further and we consider the change in temperature due to the reaction and due to uh, the flow where the, the temperature in and the temperature out might not be the same as the temperature in the reactor. So when we consider all those influences, then we'll need to update uh, the way we calculate K. But for right now, we'll just treat it as if it's a constant. Um, then in this example, so we are saying, yes, these are the kinetics and then um, the place that this is happening is this reactor and it has this volu volume, five cubic meters, and also the initial concentration. So in that reactor, whether it's a CSTR or a batch or PFR, in that reactor initially, so at T equals zero, we have that concentration. So it was uh, 60 times 10 to the power three moles per cubic meter. And by the way, it's, it's not really normal um, to use uh, SI units so strictly. So over time, I've developed that habit, but more usually people work in terms of moles per liter and, and so on. So in most textbooks, you'll see that. But I've just found it's so much easier to convert everything to SI units, and, and then you might have to convert back if somebody expects it in, in a different form. But uh, I just tend to stick to SI units. <clears throat> So that's initially in the reactor. And then it's saying here for flow cases. So that's because in our uh, list of questions, uh, there is one on a batch reactor. So that's not a flow case. So for that case, um, uh, what follows doesn't apply. But for the flow cases like CSTR and PFR, um, we are going to assume that the volumetric flow rate is this value. So 40 times 10 to the minus three cubic meters per second and that the inlet concentration is 45 times 10 to the power of three moles per cubic meter. And notice here, these are different numbers, right? Your initial concentration in the reactor 
is 60 times 10 to the three. And then you, in terms of your feed into the reactor, it's 45 times 10 to the three. And this might look obvious to you now, but um, it, over, over the years, I've, I've noticed there's this tendency to confuse these two. Um, so you want to be very careful um, about the meaning of CA naught because certain textbooks do use it interchangeably with inlet. Um, so here we are being specific. We are saying there's an initial amount in the reactor and that's generally different to, in terms of the feed coming into the reactor, the concentration in that feed, that's uh, some different number of uh, 45 times 10 to the three. Right, so in terms of uh, defining the problem, um, that's enough information to go ahead and estimate the conversion and, and all those things. Okay, so like we said, from the kinetics, we can just state this. And then we know that we can rewrite our concentration in terms of conversion. So the concentration uh, currently in the reactor is equal to um, the initial amount or inlet amount minus the amount that reacted away. So XA CA naught is what reacted away. So what's left over is uh, that difference and that's what's currently in the reactor or rather that's the concentration in the reactor. So that's the reaction rate now. Okay, and in case we need it, I, I don't think we actually do use it. In case we need to know the rate of formation of component B, uh, we can see that B is forming twice as fast as A is being consumed. And, and we have to be careful with these signs, right? The default is R is the rate of formation so when we write this, um, this is read as rate of consumption of component A. So twice the rate of consumption of A is equal to the rate of formation of B, right? So be careful. Don't just bash these things down without thinking about their meaning. That's often where many errors creep in, okay? So anyway, um, the, the, those are the kinetics and then uh, going back to the CSTR. So, well, uh, actually the first problem is asking for steady state CSTR, what's the conversion? And um, by the way, I know we spent some time developing uh, the conversion for the CSTR and, and we developed those nice looking balances. And here I'm talking about here. So we've developed all these expressions, um, but, um, and this is just my preference. Um, I tend not to uh, to remember that one. Um, the part, the, the one that looks the most natural to me is, is this version. It's not the most general uh, form of the equation, but uh, in a way it, it holds the most meaning, at least to me. So you retain that there is a rate of change of um, concentration in the reactor, and that's dependent on the flow across uh, the reactor flow in. We know that on the exit stream, you've got the same concentration as in the reactor. That's a feature of being uh, so perfectly mixed. Um, so in minus out, and then there's the reaction. So I normally um, just start from, um, uh, from that, and then I, I develop what the question is asking for. So here, uh, we were asked for steady state. We, we are told for steady state CSTR, what's the conversion? And so at steady state, dCA dt is zero. And so you can solve here and you can rewrite this in terms of CA. So you've got CA in two terms here. So if you imagine grouping CA together, you've got CA into minus one over tau uh, minus K. And so you can take that across and rewrite that as CA into uh, one over tau plus K and then uh, leaving on the right-hand side CA in over tau, that's there. And then of course you can rewrite that in terms of CA. So you can divide uh, this thing on the right-hand side um, by this factor. And then you can just multiply top and bottom by tau. So if you multiply this one by tau, you'll get CA in. And then you, you multiply the denominator by tau, you get one plus K tau. Right, so uh, tau, of course, being the space time, that's the average time the fluid is spending in the reactor. Okay, so let's go ahead and solve this. <clears throat> and the way I like to solve things is with 
Python, uh, your old friend. I, I think, yeah, if this is the, the 2EF class I saw last year. I did try convincing you to, to get into Python. Um, I, I don't think I, I was that convincing, but uh, if you go to my, uh, to my channel, um, there is a whole playlist here on programming with Python. So uh, this playlist will, will take you all the way from downloading and installing Python uh, to, um, to being able to use classes and, and download libraries and, and things like that. So um, I, I do recommend uh, getting into Python because so much of the world is involved in machine learning and, and those things today. Um, so you, you can learn Python from, uh, from this playlist, uh, but there are lots of other resources. Um, but uh, I, it, it's not required for this course, okay? So um, I, I just happen to use it um, in, uh, in my calculations. You can, of course, do the calculations however you like. And in fact, in the majority of our calculations, there's a way to do it even uh, without the computer, even if it is a differential equation. So Python is not a requirement on this course. Uh, I, and I just use it. I will explain my way through the code. It's, it's not as if you actually need to know Python to do this. So anyway, uh, this is a, a so-called Jupyter notebook uh, where uh, my Python code is listed. So here, uh, you can just ignore this part. I, I was working out some basic numbers for the problem. Here's the actual problem statement. So we said the volume is five cubic meters and the volumetric flow rate is 40 times 10 to the minus three. I'm just checking it's consistent. 40 times 10 to the minus three uh, cubic meters per second. The initial concentration is 60 times 10 to the power three and the inlet concentration is 45 times 10 to the power three. And then the kinetic rate constant is 7.5 times 10 to the minus three. So that's there. So those are the same constants that uh, are, are listed in the problem. So I'm just going to run this uh, cell so that that goes into memory. And then for this first problem for the CSTR, um, according to our formulation, uh, this is the steady state balance. So we calculate the concentration in the reactor in this way. So CA in over one plus K tau. And so that's the equation there. CA in over one plus K tau. And tau, of course, the space time is the volume divided by the volumetric flow rate. So those are defined up here. So that will create a number for tau. And I'm just printing that number just so um, we can get a sense for the, the size of the system. So when you solve these problems, always look at the numbers. Does this number make sense? Is it possible to have uh, this, uh, the scale of things? I mean, I have uh, received uh, um, submissions before where uh, the, the, the volume of the reactor was like 10 to the minus nine cubic meters. And you know, that, that's like a, a dust size, that, that, that's a reactor on the, the scale of dust, um, or sometimes it's uh, kilometers tall. So always check the scale of things, do the numbers make sense? Always, if you're writing code, add little print statements to double check uh, whether you are getting decent values out. So here, um, as I mentioned, I work in SI units all the time. So um, tau here is 125 seconds. So it's slightly more than two minutes as the space time in this reactor. And uh, that's pretty fast for an industrial reactor. And, and then it's useful to go back and look at why is that uh, just two minutes? And it's because um, it's five cubic meters. So this flow rate, I believe, is, is okay uh, for a liquid phase, um, but the, the volume, just five cubic meters, it's a fairly small reactor, and that's why it's just a, a two minute time. So the fluid is, is blasting through that reactor pretty quickly and on average it's spending just two minutes there. Um, then applying the problem, um, so the concentration just uh, we uh, just using the equation, uh, that's what we have. And then we can calculate the conversion there. So as we know, the reference amount minus the current concentration divided by the reference amount, that's uh, how we calculate the conversion and we are printing that. And you can see here a 48% uh, conversion. So close to half of what comes into this reactor is converted. 
and let, let's just think about that a bit. picture so it's saying that um, we are feeding in here at uh, I think it's 45 times 10 to the my uh, times 10 to the 3 and then it's reacting here and then it's exiting at half that so coming out here is uh, about 22 uh, 22.5 so we're coming in at 45 and leaving at 22.5 so half of the reactant is being converted and so you could say, well, I could, uh, we could look at increasing uh, the conversion in that reactor. So if uh, we spent more time, like if we spend four minutes instead of two minutes, then maybe we would have a better conversion. So you can think about doing various things like that. Um, so currently we are not saying this is a good design. We are just saying for the values given to us, four or five cubic meters and for this flow rate, um, we get approximately 50% conversion. And uh, like I said, we can think about increasing the size of the reactor so things have a bigger volume to pass through and, and so we get better conversion. A simpler thing than replacing the volume is, is just using a lower flow rate. So if you drop the flow rate to 20 cubic meters per second, 20 times 10 to the minus three cubic meters per second, then you're just flowing slower through that reactor and giving your, your product more time to form. Um, so that's another option. Of course, by reducing your flow rate through, you are also going to reduce your productivity. So you'll have a higher concentration of component, uh, of, of component B of your product, but at the expense of your productivity. So there it's a question, um, does the increase in concentration uh, match with the uh, the reduced productivity. So it might well be the case that you get uh, a higher concentration, but maybe concentration of product only goes up by 1.5, whereas we've reduced flow rate by a factor of two. So on balance, we are getting less of our product. So I'm I'm talking about all this because this is what we are trying to work out in this course, right? This comes down to the design of our reactors. Deciding whether to increase the volume or reduce the flow rate, that then has an outcome in terms of uh, the productivity and on the product purity. And it's sometimes the case that you are willing to settle for a lower productivity if you get a higher purity product. So if you get a nice high concentration of component B, that means there's less separation for you to do. You don't have to... Um, uh, separate A and B as much. So um, the saving that you get on, let's say, your distillation column or, or whatever separation unit, that might uh, make the whole thing worthwhile. So it's all a question of economics. And this kind of discussion is really part of a design. Uh, this is the design. Uh, these are design considerations. And you'll start doing more of that. Um, so there's your, your 3ED, your design course. And, um, and things like that. Uh, but it's useful to start thinking about that now. Okay, um, so that's the CSTR, right? So I may have gone a, a bit uh, off topic there, but uh, well, not really, but uh, that's the CSTR done. Now we want to solve the PFR. So for the PFR, um, you can go back to the material balance and verify it's uh, DCA D tau equals RA. And so in this case, RA is minus KCA. And you can solve this, right? Um, if you, uh, you can see here, this is simply a first order differential equation. And so you can uh, straight away write down the solution. You can say uh, CA is equal to its uh, initial value times x of minus k um, uh, times the variable here tau. So that is the analytical solution. Um, and so you can just use this to calculate ca. But I'm showing here the numerical method of doing this. So instead of solving this, um, I'm going to solve this equation first. So that's an ODE. and. We're going to use the uh, SciPy integrate uh, ODE int um, library. 
<clears throat> okay, so we, uh, we do have tau for the system and we are wanting to, to integrate dCA d tau um, equals this. Now here, tau, we are thinking of as a variable down the PFR, right? Remember PFR, we, we usually think of that as, as a long tube. And, and for that entire tube, we can define tau. So if, if this is our inlet point, then um, it's going to take us a certain amount of time to get to the exit. So for example, if our, uh, if our linear velocity is one meter per second, and if it's a five meter tube, then it's going to take us five seconds to get to the end. So five seconds in that case would be our uh, space time in that tube. Um, now that's true. So for the entire tube, it's five seconds, but we can also look at, at intermediate points along that tube. So right at the start, you can say, well, everything right at this end of the tube, right at the beginning, um, hasn't spent any time in this reactor. If you look halfway down, then the stuff there has spent half as much time. So there's 2.5 seconds that the fluid has spent there. And then at the end, it's five seconds. So you can think of tau as a continuous variable along this tube. And it's only at the end uh, that it's five seconds. So that's what tau means here. That's what, why I'm saying tau dashed, because tau is varying as you look down the tube. And so we are integrating from tau equals zero uh, to tau equals five. And so that's what we do here. Um, we create our differential equation. So that's how your ODE integrator works. And I expect you, you'll have seen this in your um, two CM course, right? Your um, applied computer methods course. Um, you will have, uh, maybe you've solved some differential equations there. So you create your uh, differential equation here, and then you tell the ODE integrator, um, use that function. So you've created your, your function here and you go ahead and use it there. And then you specify your initial condition. Now in this case, um, if it's a PFR, if it's our PFR, then the initial, uh, the, the variable is tau. Tau is in effect the distance down the tube. So initial in this case translates to inlet. Right, you can think of, instead of tau, you could have used z, so dc dz. So z, uh, where z equals zero, we think of that as our uh, initial state. And we know that at z equals zero, we basically have our inlet fluid just entering the reactor. So the concentration at this point is identical to the concentration in the feed stream. So the concentration here is in effect ca in. Right, so that's why we use CA in as our initial condition when solving this equation. That also explains why when we integrated this equation analytically, we did use uh, CA at tau equals zero equals CA in. So I should state that here as the initial condition, CA, CA at tau equals zero. A at tau equals zero equals C sub A in. Okay, so that's the initial condition in the sense of a PFR. Um, and, and so this statement then will call for our ODE to be integrated. So that will return for us CA as a function of tau. It will tell us how CA is changing down the tube. And then we can calculate how the conversion is changing down the tube as well. So we can take each of those little values down the tube and uh, we can say CA in minus that divided by CA in. So that will tell us how conversion is varying. And we can see it here, right? So at the start point, right? At the inlet, um, our conversion is zero, right? Concentration is not zero. Concentration is 60, uh, not 60, 45 moles per cubic meter. And then as we look further down the tube, we can see the conversion is rising. And in fact, let's, let's plot that as well. Let's plot, plot the second one here, plot CA. So this is CA. 
So you can see here um, at the inlet point, we had 45 moles per cubic meter. And as we went further down the tube, component A was being consumed as it was converted to component B. And so it's uh, reduced to that value. You can see it's a, it's a slight curve also. So it's, um, uh, we know the solution is an exponential. Um, we haven't looked far enough down the tube. If we increase the space time, you'll be able to see how it does further down the tube. So let's change our volume. Let's say we used 50 cubic meters instead of five. So you can see here from that 45, um, it, uh, it curves its way down, getting closer and closer to that zero, never quite reaching zero because of the nature of, um, of concentration driven reaction rates. And similarly, your conversion rises, going up closer and closer to one, never quite reaching one. But anyway, that's the nature of it. Okay, putting this back to five. Okay, so that's the exit conversion from the PFR. So 60% is what we come out with. And you can see uh, that's significantly higher than the CSTR. And so you can see that the, the, um, the specs are very similar. These are both five cubic meter reactors. We've got the same reaction happening. We've got exactly the same flow rate. So we're not talking about batch reactors where we have to worry about initial conditions. Here we are only talking about two flow reactors and the exact same things are going on in them. And the only difference is the nature of the mixing. So uh, in the CSTR, perfect mixing. In the uh, PFR, perfect not mixing. That's the only difference in these two, in these two calculations. And you can see here that this is, um, is giving us a significantly different uh, con conversion. The first one was 48%, this one is 60%. And, and so I'd like you to start thinking about that, right? We, um, we are coming to a, another section where we'll probe that in, in much more detail. Okay, so that's the CSTR and the PFR. Uh, any questions or comments so far? Okay, and then moving on to the, um, to the batch case. So for a batch reactor, what's the conversion after two hours, it says. So for the batch case, um, what did I do? Looks like I, I didn't uh, write out the batch case here. So for the batch case, so for batch, we have DCA, dt equals um, minus kca kca so that's the batch reactor and um, uh, so you can look look up the derivation of the batch reactor material balance but anyway uh, let's just solve that so it's almost identical to this case so for the for the uh, for the batch case um, we can see here it's, a, it's another first order ODE. This time the variable is time instead of space time. And so we can say here this is uh, CA as a function of time. And here now your initial condition is the initial concentration in the reactor. It is not um, the inlet concentration. Um, there's, there's no such thing as inlet concentration in the case of batch, right? You only have an initial concentration there, so that's CA naught. And then um, first order ODE, so it's an X of the constant times the variable, which should be T in this case. Right, so mathematically, there's actually no difference between these two. We are just naming the variables slightly differently, um, but uh, it's basically the same equation. But still, I went ahead and, and wrote it as if it is um, a different equation. And, and so here, um, your definition, the model for the batch case, uh, DCA DT is minus KCA, and then uh, ODE integration uh, over that same model. Um, and here, I'm, uh, CA ref is um, the initial, so your initial condition CA naught goes there. And then we are integrating this over time, and we are specifying these time values. 
So not to tau, which is not quite what the question said. The question actually said two hours. So let's set this at two hours. And um, and then we are calculating, uh, yeah, so, so that's the result of the integration. And I'm also showing here the uh, analytical uh, calculation for that. So if you run that over two hours, you can see the conversion goes up and it settles out there. Now, let's, let's change that two hours. Let's, instead of two hours, use the same space time as in the uh, plug flow and the CSTR case. So we're just going to say tau here. And when we run it, then look at that, it's, uh, it's going up to 60%. And we expected that because we said it's the exact same, it's the same equation. So we are solving the same equation. The variables are just slightly different. And then it might occur to you, but then is, is the batch reactor basically the same as a, as a plug flow reactor? And we know it's not because um, a batch reactor uh, just physically is a very different thing. It, it's uh, something like an autoclave. So you, you have this unit, you charge your, your molds, you, you actually, um, uh, there's a, a fair serious bit of work where they screw everything in place and they, uh, they treat it as a bomb and then the reaction happens there. Whereas a PFR is, is totally different. A PFR can be a series of tubes and, and you're feeding things in uh, at one end and, and it just runs for year after year. So, um, so that's continuous operation versus batch operation. So physically, these two things are different. Mathematically, the similarity is, um, is across the velocity. So in a batch reactor, real time is passing. In, um, in a PFR, um, your distance down the tube can be equivocated with the time spent reacting. So when you look down this tube, you can say uh, this plug of fluid has spent a certain amount of time, which is different to this plug of fluid. So as you look down this tube, you are seeing uh, different times uh, for reaction. So in a way you can say um, the, the stuff I see right here is what I would see in a zero time batch reactor. And as I look further down, I, I'm seeing how a batch reactor would look at, at further time um, in, its, uh, in its lifespan. So that's how, in a sense, time and space are related across batch and plug flow. Um, I'm not trying to claim we are doing anything on relativity here. I'm just saying that there's, um, because of the way we've set up the flow, that there is this relationship between time and space. So space down the tube um, has a similarity with time spent reacting. Okay, so that's, that's um, and, and in fact, that's how we get to the exact same conversion as we had in, um, in the plug flow case. So in the plug flow case, when we plot it against space time, we get the exact same curve uh, when we solve it in real time. And so we get the identical conversion. The concentration is not the same. If you look here, your exit concentration from the PFR is 17,000 or 18,000. And here it's 23,000. And that's because you are using different numbers for the initial amount. So in the batch case, we are using the, um, the initial concentration, 60 times 10 to the three. And in the plug flow case, we are using 45, uh, the inlet concentration. So you've got different um, reference concentrations, but the conversion is identical, right? So time and space are interchangeable when comparing uh, these two types of reactor and, um, and, and that shows up when you look at the conversion. Okay. 
So you can um, you can think about that. So here the batch and PFR turned out to have the the same. Um, they they converted the species to the same extent, and the CSTR only had forty eight percent. So why didn't the CSTR also have a, a sixty percent conversion? Um, maybe I've been droning on. Does anyone want to hazard a guess there? So if we think about it, the CSTR um, is, is stuck at one concentration everywhere, right? So you are feeding in at 45, it's instantaneously mixing and, um, and reacting there. Now, as the concentration or as the conversion goes up, you convert component, your, your reactant uh, to a greater extent. So the, the more you convert your component here, um, the, the lower will be your concentration of component A. And we know that, that that's kind of obvious for a reactor. The whole reason for doing this, the whole reason for setting up your reactor is you want to convert your reactant. Okay. However, in the case of the CSTR, this happens in a kind of unpleasant way because you are converting all this reactant, the, the only reaction that can happen is on this leftover unreacted amount. So if you convert everything in your CSTR, your reaction rate is going to become necessarily low because uh, you have a, a low concentration left over for reaction. So because the reaction rate itself is proportional to the concentration, right? Remember here, when we wrote the uh, rate expression, you can see the reaction rate is directly proportional to the concentration. And they are all like that. Uh, th this is a, a kind of gentle first order case. Sometimes it's, it's order two, order three. So um, it, it's uh, directly proportional and sometimes worse um, uh, between the reaction rate and the concentration. So that means if you are reducing the concentration, your reaction rate is, is definitely also going to reduce. Uh, and yet we thought we were doing a good thing. We thought uh, we were reducing, uh, we, we were getting a nice high conversion. And so we were getting a nice pure product, but that also means our reaction rate is going to go down. So why does, doesn't this also happen in the case of the PFR and the CSTR? Well, it does, but it happens in a different space. So in, for example, the PFR, um, yes, as we go down the tube, it does get converted more and more and the reaction rate goes down correspondingly. So you'll get quite a low reaction rate towards the end here. But at least there exists a zone where you do still have a high concentration of component A. So A concentration is nice and high here. So you can still enjoy a high reaction rate in some part of that reactor before uh, it runs away to these low values. So that's the case in the plug flow reactor and equivalently in the batch reactor. It's not the case that always we are stuck to one low, converge, uh, one low concentration. In the batch reactor, at least initially, so in terms of time, initially you had a high concentration of component A and as time went on, um, that concentration goes down and hence the rate went down. But there was a time when you had a high reaction rate. So that's the difference, that's why the CSTR is, in a sense, the worst possible user of its uh, reaction volume. Um, it forces the reaction rate to be the same low value everywhere, uh, whereas the other two at least have uh, a, a part of their lifespan where they have a high rate. Um, in a sense, the CSTR is the most natural kind of reactor to an engineer. It's a, you put a vessel there, you stick a stirrer in, and you blast the flow across, right? It seems obvious. But when you start looking at the design of these reactors, you start realizing, actually, if we can partition the flow in some way, uh, we, can, we can greatly improve the operation. So you see the interplay between convection and mass transfer and reaction. Those are all considerations that are going to influence our reactor designs. And that's uh, basically what the course is about.
Okay, any questions or comments there? Yeah, I think uh, we are still on the, the first date phase, so uh, we'll uh, hopefully start to get more questions coming through. And uh, if you do email them to me, then uh, we, we can also in the next session uh, talk our way through them as well. Okay, well, let's have a look here. Oh, that's from Zoom. Okay, so um, I guess that, that was basically my plan for today. And uh, so please do think about these things carefully. I will upload this video to, uh, to the playlist as well. And um, yeah, we'll, um, and there will be another set of, uh, of notes that will be released uh, later in this week. Uh, okay, that's it uh, from me for now. So pleasure to meet you all. Uh, looking forward to, uh, to progressing further on the course. Oh, some questions here. Um, PFR. Uh, yeah, on this question about integrating uh, integration for the PFR, yes, you can go ahead and uh, do that. Uh, but remember, uh, the trap uh, using traps is for a, a known integral. So if you know your integral, so if you have an equation of this form, so if it's f of x in dx and you want to know what f is then uh, that's how you do trapezoidal integration that means you have to know uh, f of x right so if you know your function that you are integrating then yes you can use traps to uh, to do that integration however in this case it's a differential equation which means we are integrating over an unknown function and you'll see in your 3PO course uh, a bit later in the, in the process modeling and optimization course um, or in your, your numerical methods course, the way you solve differential equations is you know one point, you estimate the gradient and you step forward uh, a little bit and then um, you look back to see was that a good estimate. So um, I, I think we'll, we'll do a bit of a session on how to do integration, what that integration means. So uh, trapezoidal type integration, that's, that's more for integrating under known functions, uh, whereas we are solving differential equations here. Um, yes, I can uh, certainly upload that document. Yes, I'll post it. Yeah. So uh, the video and those notes will be posted and uh, you, you can find that on the playlist. Okay. So um, I was saying there uh, that the batch reactor is is better than continuous, and and better is is a there there are different considerations here. Um, sometimes your um, see your batch reactor is an interrupted operation. You have to keep uh, stopping and and restarting the the reactor as you as you complete the batches. So there's a lot more work to do. Um, the continuous flow reactor at least just keeps operating. So even if it doesn't convert as high, it, you still have a constant stream coming out. And it's also very easy to construct. You just uh, use a pot and stick a stirrer in. Whereas uh, a batch reactor, um, yeah, it's, it's not continuous operation. And if you compare with the PFR, um, you have to uh, keep everything in plugs. It's, uh, it, it's physically difficult to retain everything in different plugs. So, um, so the, the CSTR is the easiest one to construct, but um, in terms of the reaction rate, your CSTR is stuck to one low rate everywhere in its volume. You've, you've got perfect mixing, so you've got the same concentration everywhere. So you've got the one low rate everywhere. Whereas with the batch reactor, it is perfectly mixed. You've got the same rate everywhere, but the concentration itself is changing from time to time. So initially you've got a high concentration and uh, as time goes, uh, that concentration goes down. And so eventually it gets to the low rate in the CSTR. But in terms of um, uh, initially, uh, the rate is high. So at least you get some time with a nice high reaction rate. Okay. So 
Um, as I say, uh, please keep sending your questions and, and let me know if, if that did answer the question well. And uh, yeah, I'm off to the next meeting. So thank you all for coming and I'll see you in the next one.